What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hapnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I am on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Rhys Cranny, and we speak about change and how to facilitate change with empathy and success. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper to attend to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back to be inspired. Hello, Rhys. Hello, Miriam. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to record here in your home. Yes, here in the uh, west side of Melbourne, Australia. Beautiful. And we'll speak about change. Yes, sounds good. Yeah. And what empathy has to do with change. Mm, absolutely. Mm. Change is all about people. So how do we work with those people and help them be facilitated by a great change process? Yes. Yes. And who likes change? Not many people. <laughs> <laughs> no, at least not the change that we haven't initiated ourselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've like been observing you know, lots of organizations do cultural surveys and every organization in the world scores really low on change pretty much. And so, it's this kind of funny thing that, you know, no one seems to think they do change well and they find change stressful and frustrating, but it is such a constant. We can't get rid of it. It's here. It's always here. And I even, I read once that the most successful change projects are those that communicate what remains the same. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, those sorts of things give people a sense of like there is some stability, you know, something to actually hold on and kind of go, okay, well, it's not the whole world isn't ending. We do still have something that we can rely on. Yeah. And before hitting the record button, you're sharing some insights about a project you're currently working on. And you mentioned that the internal discussion, whether to start the change process already or whether to wait until the change is really happening. Yeah. And what are the pros and cons of preparing an organization slowly that change will happen versus ripping the band-aid off mm. and just initiating the change right away? I'd say it depends on the change itself, obviously, but there's I think it's kind of when you have people sitting in uncertainty. And so if you have a change that you can do where you can go, all right here's what it's going to look like, here's what we're trying to change, here's what we're trying to achieve and do that pretty quickly, you know, sometimes that can be better than spending more time doing the planning and working out who are we going to engage in what order and what time because ultimately it's that sort of when people are sitting there waiting, wondering what's going to happen, mm -hmm. they start thinking about the worst and start imagining that it's possibly going to be so much bigger than it really will be. True, which reminds me of one thing that we dislike even more than change, which is uncertainty. Yeah, right? completely. Yeah, Because people want a sense of control. And if you, I mean, if you are creating a change, if you're driving a change, like that can be quite empowering because there's something that you're in control. You've, you've kind of, you know, you're the one doing it. But if it's kind of happening to you, I mean, you, we, we look at like the COVID experience that we've all been through. Like that was a change that was monumental. And like, actually, probably the worst bit of it was the uncertainty of, Like initially, what is this? What does it mean? And you're kind of sitting there a little bit scared because you don't know how bad this virus is going to be or you don't know like how you catch it or how it's transmitted. You know, there's so much uncertainty around how it transmits. And then once we kind of worked that out a bit, you were still a bit like, oh, if I go out in this place, is that going to be safe? Like there was, it was that sort of stress of the unknown that was kind of the big factor. Yes, I know. Come back to the stress factor in a second. I was just thinking back of a conversation I had with Steph Clark, and she mentioned the pandemic as an example that there was so much pain that actually people were, and we talked about learning and development and training. Mm. So the pain was so big that people were actually happy to change because the pain of staying the same yeah. was higher than the pain to change. Yeah. And now being back from this extraordinary case of COVID, suddenly it's we're back to the case where change might be more painful than staying the same. Absolutely. I mean, I was thinking about this and like, you know, we had pretty hard lockdowns in Melbourne and there was a pretty long period of time where things were 
probably on paper back to normal. Like we could go out, we could go to events, we didn't have to wear masks everywhere. But like I was still probably living like I did during lockdown where I was kind of like, I don't really want to go to nightclubs and I don't want to go to places with heaps of people and I'm still going to wear a mask if I'm in a crowded space, which like obviously is the right health advice, but was still kind of really hesitant to engage in life in the way that I had pre-pandemic. Yeah. And that's so interesting because I had a similar behavior that I wouldn't go out as before pandemic and engage as before pandemic. And I think for me, it wasn't even because of the fear of catching the virus, but rather the the behavioral change of not being used to crowds anymore. Yeah. So the, it was more the social anxiety yeah. than the health well, and, and anxiety. And I mean, not, not used to that like human interaction that yeah. we're used to just do all the time. Like yeah. I've had probably two examples recently where I've been in a public environment, maybe going to a show or going to something, and I've, you know, you, you make eye contact with people in the crowd. And I looked at someone and then sort of looked away and then I kind of went, hang on a minute, I know that person. But by that point, I'd already blanked them and they'd kind of gone, oh, well, they'd kind of walked off. And it was like, it was as if this muscle of recognizing people in public was just wow. weakened. <laughs> and what does that actually mean for employees coming back to the workspace? Because, I mean, we're talking about the change of the lockdown, the change that's coming now from a restructuring process. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But what about the change of coming out of lockdown and mm. basically coming back to the office and not being used anymore to the small chit chat, yeah. the interaction? Absolutely. I think, I mean, I was reading some research this week, which was talking about actually working from home is not the amazing thing that we thought it was. Like there's so many elements of it that do benefit our mental health in a really good way but there's a lot of parts of it that are really negative and really detrimental to our mental health and we've got to try and work out the balance like as humans we need interaction with people and that's a really good thing for us and we need incidental exercise like that walk to the train station and then the walk to the office is actually really good for us and it's not the same as walking to the fridge and then back to you know <laughs> what <laughs> yeah and so there's all these kinds of little elements of the old world of pre-COVID than working in an office that's really good and being with people and sort of having face-to-face -face interactions, like all that stuff's really, really awesome. But then, you know, on the flip side, there's like all these other elements that we've learned to embrace of being able to put washing on during a meeting or like unload the dishwasher, you know, just go off camera and off you go. And so, trying to kind of work out how do we like maintain these good elements of of you know, perhaps if we're able to re work remotely with the change of going back into the office and trying to engage as humans again, you know, how do we manage both of those things? Yeah. And what kind of stress elements are actually involved in that? I remember, again, before hitting the record button, you mentioned the study about different elements that add to stress. And mm. one of the surprising ones was that going on holidays can yeah. be a stress factor. And I'm just thinking of meeting someone face to face in the office is also some sort of uncertainty. Going to the mm. office, I'm not in control who I will meet and yeah. how it and will And where be. they've been and who they've interacted exactly. with. Exactly. <laughs> what kind of questions they're going to ask me. Yeah. So, what is expected? So, these small kind of stresses that we lost the habit of actually coping mm. with. Yeah. I, I haven't been aware of that and how it could tie us then to stay home, mm. believing that it's better for us because it feels safe. Yeah. Although actually it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, so that, that study, um, I think it's called the Holmes Rahi stress inventory. And I came across it when I was studying change at university. And at the start of that semester, I'd gone through some pretty horrible change. I'd had a, you know, a close, someone close to me had died and I'd been, I was going through a lot. I messaged my tutor to say, hi, uh, I'm having a stressful time. Here's why. I may or may not be super engaged. And if I'm not, like, there's the reason. And I mean, you know, sometimes you have particularly wonderful teachers and this one, was so accommodating, but even to the point where like before certain classes, she'd email me and say, okay, here's the stuff we're covering this week. Here's what I imagine could be potential trigger points. If this is going to be 
you know, we'll, we can work together. If you want to come, we can work through that. If you need to step out, that's fine. If you don't want to turn up and you want to learn in a different way, we can facilitate that. And it was just, it was extraordinary. But I did go along and we um, had this discussion about stress and it was kind of, you know, it was a change course. So, we were looking at like how does change impact people and we started off with this stress test or stress, I don't know, measurement. So, it kind of had this whole list of different events and different things that can happen to an individual and then it had a kind of number attached to each one. So, obviously, things like someone close to you dying or, you know, losing your job, like those sorts of things rated really, really highly. And, and, you know, when you add them together, it sort of said, actually, if you've got a high number accumulatively over a year, you've got a much higher risk of having a negative health impact. Mm -hmm. So, it was recognizing that that cumulative stress can have a really big impact on health, not just mental health, actual physical health. And so, kind of looking at that, there were also things which were surprising, like going on holidays was like, I can't remember what the number was, but it was, it was a contributor to stress. Cause if you think about it, that's a change to your routine. It's a change to your environment, your location. You know, we do see holidays as a really positive change and something that you're usually trying to look forward to. But often the lead up to a holiday, you're maybe rushing to finish all the work so you can have that break. And we are not in control. Yeah. And so many things can go wrong. And especially, I think, especially when we're looking forward to it, then we imagine all these worst case scenarios yeah. of missing our train, of getting sick, of losing our passport. Yeah. And um, I can totally relate to that. Uh, I was talking to a friend the other week who went on a holiday and she's a seasoned traveler, but she got to a destination in the, like some remote place in a, a, a country far away. And they're like, oh, we don't have your reservation for the accommodation, your travel agent or something had gone wrong from the travel agent's perspective. And so, it's kind of like, all right, I am very far from home and now I do not have a place to sleep. How do I deal with this? Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I remember I arrived in Dubai. It was my first travel after the lockdown and I couldn't sleep two nights before and I used to travel a lot. Yeah. So, I lost totally the muscle of traveling. And then I arrive in Dubai without any cash on me. My credit card doesn't work and my debit cards don't work. That was kind of stressful. Yeah, completely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it eventually all worked out. But this idea of being trapped yeah. somewhere. And it's that thing of change and lack of control or loss yeah. of control yeah. and yeah. uncertainty. Yeah. It's sort of this, yeah, really stressful thing for people. So, bringing all of this back to the corporate or to the organizational context, what does it then mean for a successful change process? Well, I think ultimately you've got to think about the people and really imagine, you know, the impacts on individuals. And certainly when you're planning a big change or a small change, ideally you're doing these sort of change assessments and kind of looking at what the impacts are going to be and even down to like each individual, who's going to be impacted in what way. Is it a change to how they work? So, are we maybe sort of wanting them to do what they do differently? Is it a change to who they report to? Is it a change to the team they exist mm-hmm. in? And that kind of the day-to-day relationships that they may sort of engage with. Maybe it's new technology and, and we're needing them to adapt to a very different system. And all of these things are things that happen routinely in organizations and have to happen because the external environment is changing constantly. But you know, we we do have to really think carefully of like how do we engage people and support people through this process mm-hmm. and give them that sense of autonomy and direction and and participation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just thinking that how cool would it be? And then coming back to what we discussed earlier, whether to prepare an organization and the employees for a change um, versus whipping the band-aid off. When I imagine that I know that a change will come and then I have time to actually think for myself or align or brainstorm with my colleagues, what is for me the best response to this change? So, for mm-hmm. instance, if I, if I have to report to a different person, so having time to reflect, okay, what did I actually learn from reporting to this other person? What is the opportunity? What do I want to change? Yeah. And how can I benefit from that? Yeah. If I have to change location or whatsoever. Mm. And it's tricky because there's so many different ways you can approach a change. And 
on the one hand, you want to give people plenty of notice and kind of rip the band-aid off so that it's kind of like, all right, well, this is what the future is going to look like. At the same time, if you haven't done enough preparation and you go in and say, okay, this is what we're doing and it's like, well, people will have all these questions and if you don't have answers to those questions, that could make it even worse. So, you're creating more uncertainty. So, you've got to really get the balance right in exploring, you know, what do we want the the people that we work with to think and feel and when is the appropriate time to like recognizing that there will be some negative emotions and there will be some challenging experiences when do we actually orchestrate that at the best Mm. time and how to also accompany or facilitate the process for the leaders Mm. because i'm thinking back what you said initiating change is very easy it's not hurtful because we're in control so leadership those who have decided on the change in the best case for them it's all easy so how do create empathy in them to actually help the organization and the employees go through that change yeah i wouldn't say it's always easy for leaders like obviously it's easier for them to be sort of sitting back and making the decisions but there's a lot of leaders who struggle with disappointing people or struggle Mm -hmm. with some of those really difficult conversations and rightly so like that's probably one of the hardest parts of a leader's job and so that's kind of i think another element that has to be managed and facilitated to make sure that you know it's looked after but i think it's really important for leaders to be present and really understand like what their people are thinking and feeling i think when you see changes that are done where maybe the decision makers are not very engaged in the workforce, doesn't usually go well. (laughs) You you often find like probably a bit more change resistance because the people are like, well, you know, these people who are making decisions don't know what's actually happening Mm. to us or what we're experiencing. How can they make these decisions? So, uh, always I think the number one thing is for leaders to be out there and even if it's difficult. There was a leader that I worked with a few years ago where this was just as the pandemic was hitting and basically we tried a number of times to do this kind of town hall concept Mm -hmm. like we used to have probably once a quarter we'd invite all the staff into a big auditorium and you know (laughs) there were i don't know like 600 to a thousand staff that would get invited each time probably about 300 would turn up on a good day so they're pretty big events and we also had different kind of campuses, so we'd be trying to work out how we engage them. You know, there was an office in Vietnam and there were sort of others around this, uh, around Australia and so we were trying to work out like, okay, can we live stream to them and we'd bring in all this IT assistance to kind of make it work and so often it wouldn't. <laughs> but then the pandemic hits and this leader is like, all right, we've got a lot of questions. People are really uncertain about what's happening mm-hmm. and they don't know like – you know, we don't really know what's going on, but we just have to be present. We have to be visible. We have to go out and talk to people and no one's allowed to leave their homes. So, we're going to have to do this online. And like, I don't think any of us had really heard of Zoom before. <laughs> <laughs> it was at that time in the in the world. And so, I was just thinking like, how are we going to do this? Like, we've tried to do this kind of thing of live streaming to different locations before with all the AV support available and it's just not been very good. And you want to do this in two days with no IT help <laughs> to 600 individuals from your living room. Are you insane? Like, and so, so we just kind of made it work. We kind of jumped in. Thankfully, you know, the organization had a Microsoft Teams license that was kind of still being rolled out. But we got on, we did this broadcast and had open Q&A. And so, wow. we had like hundreds of people with the ability to write in questions anonymously if they wanted to. And we published every single one. We, we did not moderate and we were really clear on that. We were like, we're not hiding anything. We are here to answer your questions. Whatever emotion you have, like hopefully you'll be kind and respectful. But ultimately, if you're in a bad mood, that's going to come through. <laughs> and wow. So, there's so much to unpack when you say you didn't moderate it. What I hear is you didn't censor it. Yeah. And with 300 people in the space, how... From a facilitation perspective, how did you go about it? And did you have these raging voices? How did you deal with all these yeah. emotions? It was tricky. <laughs> we, we, I think, initially sort of started off with a bit of a script. And so, we had, okay, here's 
the key messages, here's the presentation that we want to deliver. So here's what we know. And then we just went into open Q and A. And that worked really well. Like we didn't have kind of people jumping on yelling. It was it, all the Q and A was through chat, which was beneficial. But as I said, we published every single question that came in. And so we were in the moment kind of reading the responses and and this leader that I was working with did it brilliantly like she would see what was coming in and go you know if there was a particularly pointed one you know she'd go I can really hear the frustration in this question and I totally understand it and just have this moment of acknowledging mm-hmm. the emotion that was there and it, yeah it was extraordinary and afterwards like there were messages pouring in saying well thank you first of all but also like that was really brave like it's you know i think pretty unusual that you do have a leader that is so comfortable and confident just to throw themselves to the wolves and go i'm just gonna have to deal with this because that's what my role is yeah i i have to assure these people and whatever that takes i'm gonna do it it was amazing and i wonder what there is to learn from this, it was a, an exceptional situation which called for an exceptional response. And what holds us back? Well, the question is, did this continue after the pandemic? Or, yeah. Because what holds us back or what holds organizations back to have a similar compassionate response to emotional reactions to change yeah. under more normal circumstances. Yeah. Well, we actually kept doing these events every single week, <laughs> like every usually Thursday for an hour. And it just, it became like a variety show. And so, my job as the communications manager suddenly had shifted. I mean, we were still doing the newsletters and still doing, you know, all the normal comm stuff that we did, but it suddenly turned into like TV production. (laughs) And so, each week I was working with all these different people to curate an hour variety show where we'd have different guests and we would had like, you know, someone come in and do a musical performance, which was amazing. And then a few weeks later, the guy who did the musical performance got injured and passed away. And so, then we had to like facilitate this kind of grieving process and we brought in a counsellor and we talked about kind of all of that. And, 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 you know, it was, it was insane, like the sorts of experiences we worked through together in this like quasi TV show. It's corporate group therapy. It was, it absolutely was. And I mean, as well at a time when everyone was stuck at home in lockdown, Mm. we had people saying that that was like the hour every week that they looked forward to the most because they felt connected to their colleagues. They felt informed by their leader and it was a little break from the mundane. That's beautiful. And when I think of a town hall, I think of all these people sitting in rows yeah. watching the stage. And the equivalent in Zoom would be everyone just being there in a big plenary looking at the leader Yeah, as one of the tiles. Did you use any breakouts or anything to connect the audience? Or was it really we're all in this one room together yeah. and go through this? In these ones, we didn't have kind of like random people dialing in. It was, it was fairly managed from that perspective but we did have open chat so the chat function kind of became how everyone was communicating and so you know you'd you'd have i don't know the leader would get on and be like hang on i'm getting i've had some tech difficulties can everyone hear me and then suddenly everyone's like yeah yeah we can hear you and all these (laughs) messages are coming in there'd be you know questions posted live and and you know if someone shared something that people particularly liked they'd go oh wow that's amazing like there was actually this dialogue that just existed between the presenters and the audience and that's beautiful because it's hard to imagine that actually something with such a big group can be so engaging yeah. and i think it might even be more engaging than a in-person town hall because everyone was sitting basically in the first row yeah absolutely <laughs> and has the same opportunity to engage and participate yeah. as everyone else yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I mean, I think, you know, I've, I've moved on from that organization. I think the, the leader who I worked with has as well. And now, you know, we're out of COVID and, and like perhaps the need for that has changed, but I still think that kind of model has a lot of value. I think bringing people together in the good times mm-hmm. when it's not just about like a big change or a big restructure or some kind of thing that's pushing us to do differently, having those moments of human connection Mm. just pay off so much more when you do have hard announcements or hard things to work through. Because if you've got that trust in the organization already, 
it pays dividends when the when the t- tough times are there. Yeah, love that. And at the same time, I wonder what's the difference between a change that's put upon us and basically affects everyone in the same time. COVID, the leaders were as surprised and helpless as the employees, and they had to step up to really show mm. leadership. So it was an opportunity for them that maybe many missed. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> and then the change processes that are planned, mm. reorganization, for instance. Yeah. What is the difference in terms of facilitating the change for the organization? Yeah. I mean, I guess the difference is that ideally with a planned change, you've got time to plan. <laughs> there were a lot of changes that I worked on in, in previous organizations and previous roles where you'd have a particular restructure perhaps. You know, maybe there's going to be a new function created and that's going to kind of mean a few people will need to move around and there'll need to be some new skills and some new responsibilities and new roles and lots of different things. And there was one that I worked in in particular where it was a very long process from a planning perspective because we kind of had this roadmap of, all right, we've got to get to this point where we're creating one new division. But in the lead up to that, we've got to land all these other things first, because if we haven't delivered these things, we won't be able to get to that final goal. And I mean, that was kind of great from a change management planning perspective to understand what that final goal was because it meant that at Mm. every step of the way we could be trying to build unity and with every little change that happened and there were changes to systems and changes to i mean we were we were looking at kind of the agreement that that underpinned employment for everyone like it was Mm -hmm. that that was a huge change by itself but trying to work through all of these different discrete changes in a way that helped contribute to achieving that final one was amazing (laughs) and so rarely you get that kind of lead up and vision and plan and it sounds as if everything would just kind of flow you know where you want to go and then you by backward induction you know exactly what the next step is And then you deal with humans. Yeah, (laughs) which is the tricky bit. So I imagine you have all this plan laid out, which could be a waterfall model, and still you have to be agile in every implementation step because everything that you implement will, by definition, have impact on the organization and change the next step. Mm, Completely. And and at every step, there were things that jumped out that were just like, oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Where did that come from? And I think that's just part of, you know, being in an organization. You know, you would be working normally and still have those things happen, right? Like, yeah. without that kind of, we need to move in this direction, there's always going to be stuff that will happen that will kind of be the curveball that you need to respond to. They probably feel a little bit bigger when you've got that plan of Mm -hmm. like, this is where we need to go. Suddenly there's things that are pushing us off track. When it's just normal time, like that sort of thing isn't probably as big an issue. So how do you facilitate then the stakeholder management basically? Mm. There's so many elements. I think being as open and transparent with people is, is so important because I mean, some leaders are good performers, but like most people can kind of sniff when they're not maybe being as honest or open as they could be. So, we do need to make sure that we're being real with people. And particularly when you like, there's a lot of organizations and businesses that have certain like legal requirements where uh, the freedom of information can, Mm -hmm. there can be requests that go, actually, I want all the detail on this. And so, if you work in one of those spaces, like, You've got to be honest with people because they can actually ask for the data and the, and the documents. So, I'd say that that's one of the key ones. I think it's really important, we talked about before, kind of actually recognizing what's not changing and kind of giving people some clarity around what's going to be the same and what they can continue to expect. And yeah, expectation management. Yeah. I'd like to jump on that, especially in the light of what is the best communication channel and A town hall is usually very unidirectional or with some questions could be a nice format for some. Mm. Sometimes maybe more of a workshop and group work 
program could be another one. But then this might raise expectations of how involved is everyone actually. Yeah. So what are the moments that it would make sense to really include those who are affected and give them a voice? Yeah. Versus maybe not giving them a voice because they cannot change anything anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we've done a bit of change training in my current project, actually, where we have talked about that and gone, in any change, there are things you can control. Mm. And like the number one is whether you work there or not. Like in most cases, if there's a change to a system, you can go, well, screw this. I'm going to go yeah. work somewhere else. And that's that's something that we all can control, you know. But I think... Yeah, but still, I think engaging people is important. People need information, they need answers, and they, you know, it just comes down to respect. You know, if you respect your people, you need to provide these things. And so, trying to work out how do we actually explore this in a way that is going to allow people to feel as though they've been properly engaged and they have the right information and the right direction. A lot of people don't want to be involved in creating what's next. They mm -hmm. just want to have that clear guideline of here's what we're going to do and why. And if people have that information, you know, I think things tend to go a bit more smoothly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have had, interestingly as well, you know, and I won't go into details on my current project, but we've been sort of thinking about how do we engage people in this like post-COVID world? Because two, three years ago, if there was a big change, you'd bring everyone into a room And you'd have a, pre a leader get up, they'd do a presentation, you would say any questions, and then afterwards you'd sort of have this like care plan, I suppose. And so if it was a particularly difficult change, you'd probably have a counselor on site to kind of talk to people. You'd be able to see the body language, so you'd be probably able to tell maybe which people were finding it a bit complex or a bit difficult. You'd be able to see them in the office the next day and go, how are you feeling? Like, how are you processing this information? Do you have any questions? The challenge now is that, like, a lot of people are working from home. There's a, a real hybrid environment. And so, we're trying to think about, like, what does caring for people look like now? Like, mm -hmm. if we can't see them and say, you're looking a bit tired or you're looking a bit stressed, like, is there something I can do to help? If we can't actually identify that live in real time because if you call someone on a zoom call or if they're expecting the call you know it's, it's a little bit hard to be maybe genuine in how you're feeling and also it requires a lot of psychological safety yeah. and or courage to express to ask maybe the questions that you're really interested in yeah or to express your disappointment frustration sadness anxiety mm. so it's so easy to hide At home, coming back yeah. to what we talked about uh, initially. And yeah. I like those release moments are so important. Like, you know, remember that workshop we did probably yeah. two weeks yes. ago with, with Michelle, where there's a big community infrastructure project happening. It's going to be really good in the long run, but mean heaps of disruption in the short term. Michelle, you know, her beautiful workshop plan was like, all right, how do we create or work out where these like pressure release moments mm -hmm. are yeah. where we've got a really passionate community who are really, really concerned and rightly so about what's possibly going to happen, but we're not going to have a constructive conversation if it's all about emotion. Yeah. We have to acknowledge the emotion and we have to work with it and it needs to be there, but we also need to be able to look past that and work out like what are our priorities as a community. And actually working out how you facilitate those pressure releases yes. is really valuable and really important. I remember, and I think it's um, interesting for the audience, how we work together in this kind of experience of the participants of this workshop as they came in. And some of them were really angry when they came in. Yeah. And you were the first point of contact, <laughs> kind of welcoming them. Would you like a sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> the, the look on their faces changed immediately. Yeah, free food always works. Yeah. And I think you prepared them that there will be a point that they can already share their point of view. Yeah. And then they came to my station, air quotes, where... I offered them a pen and paper to put their voice and their opinion, their anger on the wall. Mm. And remember, some of them said, I better don't do that because my opinion won't be appreciated. And I smiled at them and said, 
please do yes it will be appreciated now is the time yeah and they were kind of so caught off guard like what yeah <laughs> i cannot be angry but it's okay <laughs> it's okay to be angry yeah. yeah i mean i remember one of my first jobs was in retail and you'd have someone come in because the product they bought hadn't met their expectations and they walked in like they were looking for a fight mm. and when you listened to them and went oh that sounds really annoying you kind of there was this look of surprise and then you actually helped them and there was kind of like oh thank thank you and, and then they walked out with a smile and yeah. you know people just need to be listened to and have how they're feeling acknowledged and allowed to be legitimate yeah i think as long as they are taken seriously yeah i think the worst is that you smile at them like oh yeah it's all okay but yeah. actually you're not you're not with them yeah. not genuinely and I don't know whether it's related, but a thought that came up in our conversation now a couple of times that change somehow is also related with this deep anxiety of not being good enough. Yeah. So if I was good enough, then nothing would have to change. Mm. So if I'm affected, if something has to change, or if I have to change, it means that it's not good enough yet. Yeah. And how do we acknowledge that because I think it's something that we rarely speak about and it's one of those anxieties we all have yeah. <laughs> as a human species and it comes up in change. Completely. Like all those insecurities that we all just carry around when there is a change happening, like they all bubble up to the top and yeah, totally. I've worked on a number of changes where we've really thought like, okay, well, we're, we're trying to propose this difference in the organization and maybe it's like a new system or something and it's like we're not telling people that everything they do is wrong and that we you know don't love their work and we don't appreciate them we absolutely do we really need them in this organization and they bring a lot of value but we do need to do this differently for a whole bunch of different reasons there was one change that i was involved in and working with some really amazing change managers at a university where the university was deciding to bring in a new learning management system and so this is the system that every single student and every single staff member uses uh -oh. for everything <laughs> like it was just huge or, or or it should have been the system they use for everything we knew that some were kind of working around it and so like that's a huge change process and not only were we're getting people onto a new system, but we also wanted them to use it in the same way. And that was difficult because everyone had a different teaching style and everyone had a different communication style. And there was a lot of value in that. But at the same time, we knew from our students that that was really annoying because every time they started a new subject, there was this whole different way of learning that they had to adapt to. And this like, you know, the information that was in one place for one subject was in a different place for another subject. And at universities, you have the freedom of teaching that every professor is taking advantage of, yeah. that they are allowed to do it their way. Exactly. How did you deal with that? It was tricky. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was probably the one of the biggest challenges. And it wasn't to say that like the teachers weren't doing a great job. We knew that there were really good learning experiences happening, but we were just trying to create some consistency so that there was a little bit less noise for the students so that the student experience was a little bit more simplified and, you know, ultimately so that the students had a better time. Like we wanted them to not be so encumbered by trying to navigate a new subject and instead be focused on what they were there to learn. Yeah. And this example of the learning management system makes me wonder in a change process where you have different stakeholders and different levels, whom to prioritize. So mm. you have, in this one, you have the students and the academics and the entire administration and the very clear power dynamics and hierarchies. Yeah. And in, in any organization, you have similar, maybe not as extreme, but you also have power dynamics and hierarchies. So you have the user, you have those who put the information in, you have those who are affected, those who drive the change. How do we get them all together? Or is it, and everyone is affected by the change, but in yeah. very different ways. Yeah. And it's tricky. I think, I mean, like most organizations, you want to be customer first because the customer, if the customer goes away, everything else does. Yeah. And so the sort of student perspective was really vital in, mm. in that project. So, you know, the end goal was to improve life for the students, 
But the recognition was to do that, we also need to improve life for the teachers and really work with them to to kind of support them to yeah. deliver this new way of working. And I think you well, I worked at universities also for a long yeah. time. So um and I find it interesting because so I understand that students here at the university you worked for were paying f tuition fees so they were really the customers the clients mm. so clients first in germany for instance and the netherlands education is free so students yeah. don't pay okay so yes they are still the clients but with a very different power yeah in their hands and then i'm thinking that Yes, of course, the professors are those who actually deliver and the university is nothing without them, but still the support staff, mm. the entire administration, are those without power, but are actually steering the ship. Yeah. And I mean, like the professors, the teachers, their customers in some respects, like they are the customers of those central systems, like mm. the, the central policies and this, okay, we're bringing in this new learning management system. Like the teachers are a, a customer there as well because they're the ones who are actually using it. And so you've got to really think how do we support them through this process because like it's, you know, they're the ones who are crucial to this whole thing. Like yeah. if they get on board if they don't get on board like the students are probably not going to really notice like they'll notice if the experience is poor but like the existing model was like it was a different experience every time they went in and it's going to be a new cohort of students every year anyway exactly. so it just yeah. fades out that's the right. frustration fades out yeah but <laughs> yeah. but ultimately like you don't want your customer to walk away from your product or the experience they have with you And tell other people, like, oh, it was, like, totally disorganized. It was so, like, mental. And, like, that was the experience that a lot of people had. I remember I started studying at that university and the, it was really hard to navigate. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, maybe that's what gave me a bit of the passion to help change that and, mm -hmm. and be part of the organization that was trying to, you know, make it better. But it was, I mean, all large organizations like that, particularly ones that have so many different groups and components and working areas like yeah. it becomes complex and how do you integrate thinking back of the huge change process that the university that i worked for before giving up yeah <laughs> <laughs> went through where the support staff were actually those who were most affected mm. and those who had least of a word because well they were less likely to to run away yeah so and Maybe they were easiest to replace, or at least this was a perception. Mm. But if they get frustrated, because they have to to drive the change, basically. Yeah. So how can you include in an empathetic way those who are most affected but have the least power? Yeah. I'd say the thing that comes to mind with this is that, like, in most organizations, if you need to push a change through, you can do it. Like, there's enough different levers that you can just say, actually, this is how it's going to be and everyone get in line. The thing that really that mucks up is the culture. And the question mm -hmm. is whether you care about culture or not. I think everyone should care about culture <laughs> because it's, it's you know, has the biggest impact on your experience of work and your experience of your colleagues and who you work with. So, you know, ideally that culture concern is, is brought in from the beginning and you should have leaders who are thinking Like, what is the culture that I want to set and how am I going to maintain that through culture change or through organizational change? So, particularly when you are working with perhaps a impacted group that are going to experience the change in a big way, but maybe not have as much ability to influence it or change it, that's where you have to kind of work out, like, what are the ways that we can engage them in this in a positive way? Mm. And, like, part of it could just be just listening And kind of going in and saying, how does this make you feel? How do we work through that? Because that's something that we can actually work together on. Mm. If this change has to happen in this way, like let's look at the human elements that exist all around that process and, and try and work on that together. Thinking back of your professor when you went through your change and stress. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like we've got this thing called COVID. We can't get rid of it. <laughs> we can't go around it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it. So, actually, okay, we've got 
all this emotion and all these people that we can work with. Like, let's actually focus on that and let's focus on building human connection and creating a really positive culture, even amid all this insanity. Mm. Yeah. Given that it exists and that's wanted by the leadership. Yeah. I think they sufficient examples. Absolutely. Thinking of Twitter. Yeah. Or Facebook. Mm, yes, well, I wouldn't want to be working in those places at the moment. There's uh, <laughs> probably a lot of cultural problems because there's been changes that are happening and for whatever reason, they probably need to happen. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, you, you are seeing a lot of people who are saying it's not a great place to go to work every day yeah. and that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, and leaders always have a choice how to approach change. I'm just thinking back of the story that you told me <laughs> earlier. Your most recent workshop where you worked with the leadership <laughs> to initiate change. Can you please share this with the audience? <laughs> and, and what drove you and what... Uh, so, out? I, in workshops, just like to have an element of surprise. And I think in the workshop we did recently about the level crossing thing, there was a surprise when people walked into the room because they looked at the chairs and went, hang on a minute. It's not in rows. It's in little U shapes. There's hundreds of little U shapes. Am I going to have to talk to people? And, and like that kind of surprise just, you know, threw people off guard in a good way, but then meant you could steer them towards something mm -hmm. positive. And yeah, I like to do that a little bit in, in whenever I'm working with people. So I did do a workshop recently with a leadership group and, you know, we're going to be working through change together. We need to be really on board with supporting each other. And I kind of ran around the room a little bit like, Oprah, you get a car, but getting people to shout like, I'm a change maker because it's like, we all are change makers here. That's what our work is about. We're about, you know, doing better for our customers. And so we need to own that. So scream it at me. <laughs> and it was funny because it, it like it, it set a really different mood for the rest of the workshop. I mean, understandably, I think most of them were looking at me being like, this guy's insane. But I think as well, like being a little bit silly or kind of putting yourself out in mm. that way. I think can give other people permission to be a little bit freer and be a bit more authentic. So, did they follow? We had a few that did, absolutely. Um, a few that were maybe a little resistant, but that's fine. And, you know, I think like pushing ourselves outside our comfort zones mm -hmm. in a group setting is really, really valuable. Like I think about all the stuff, like so many of the workshops that I've participated in with Never Done Before, where like People have done crazy things. You, if you if you look at like the workshop plan, whatever it was on paper, it's like that is nuts. But actually, some of those really crazy workshops have just had the most extraordinary feeling of human connection. Yeah. And there have been things that I've talked about for months afterwards, but felt like this incredible warmth and strength with these people I didn't actually know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm in particular thinking of the parties that. Jacques oh, initiated. Yeah. And great example. <laughs> I recently had him on the show again. And what he is getting people to do is just, yeah. Every time thinking back, I'm like, did we really? Because <laughs> I looked at this was the first time, the first never done before I did. I don't know. I, I, I was looking at who was presenting and I looked at his website and I looked at videos and I was like, what is this guy about? I don't understand what this is. And I went to it and this was at the end, the closing ceremony. Yeah. Like I'd had this really amazing experience with all these different workshops and I just threw myself into it. And it was, it was so much fun. Like I felt so good at the end of it. And actually my, my boyfriend came into the room as I'm like up and dancing and I don't know, we were singing or we were serenading someone like Whitney Houston, I can't remember. And he looks at me like, what have I walked into? What are you doing? And I just looked at him like, you're either in or you're out. Like, <laughs> you're not a spectator here. You're participating or get out of the room. It's a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Who chose to leave? But yeah, I, I, I just loved that approach. And, you know, I've worked with other facilitators who are just so good at building that human connection through weird and wonderful approaches. Yeah. And every time you see people walk out feeling like amazingly connected to each other. Yeah. Like there was one workshop I, I sort of worked on with Emily Polo, a friend of mine, and I brought her into this organization. I was like, and I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was given like probably too long a lead in this role. They, it was like, do whatever you want. I'm like, great. And I had sort of set in my mind as the communications manager that the thing that we needed to work on was connection to each other as a workforce. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why is a comms person doing this? 
I don't know. <laughs> and so, I was like, I'm going to call up my friend Emily and we're going to do this kind of workshop all on building connection and like exploring our collective potential. Mm-hmm. And so, we did these workshops where like em- Emily was just the most amazing facilitator. She is the most amazing facilitator and had basically brought all these co-workers together and kind of mixed them up and had this activity where they they got pretty deep into talking about who they were and not just like what they are, like who they are, and then would have this like moment of kind of feeding back, you know, what the people listening heard. And it was really affirming. Being witnessed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, at the end of this, we did like a survey thing and there were some people who hated it, (laughs) which is fair enough. But the majority of the people who participated, like 80 to 90% of people were like, that was incredible. And I have never felt so much belonging and so much connection to my colleagues and I wish we could do this all the time. Can we do this all the time? And so, little moments like that, we kind of then morphed that into another big workshop, which was really focused on, okay, well, if this is like who we are as a workforce, what's our purpose as individuals mm-hmm. and how do we live that at work? And so, kind of used all that to build our collective potential or our collective purpose. And it was just like, I mean, it was the most probably bizarre thing to happen in an organization because you don't see people do that like you don't have those real deep psychologically brave moments with colleagues usually but it just created such an extraordinary feeling in the room Mm. and and I think that had a really big impact on you know how we work together afterwards yeah and what it thank you for these examples (laughs) I think that's great and so encouraging and what I hear that there are different components a it requires bravery by the facilitator or maybe sometimes overconfidence or a little bit of (laughs) naivete. Yeah. And then it requires the first or a senior person to actually join and say, hell yes. So when I think of you running through the room with the leadership team and asking them to shout at you, (laughs) I'm a change maker, (laughs) who would be the person to dress first? And as Jacques did it, he usually first as I'm um, the community leader of NDB, he would first ask me to jump in. Yeah. And then I go, hell yeah, and kind of make a fool out of myself. <laughs> and then he he usually, I think, and I guess he does it consciously, would then approach the second most senior or yeah. another very senior person who is likely to yes and yeah the definitely. Thing. Yeah, you, you do have to be selective because if you do that sort of thing and it just the first person doesn't engage (laughs) you're doomed so you do have to be planned and i think i would always go for the most senior person in the room and hopefully like wear them up a bit kind of say i'm going to do something a bit unusual and i just need you to be positive and enthusiastic your back yeah my back and and so if you maybe kind of you know take that approach but it's about creating a sense of permission yeah and if you've got this either either there are uh you know a leader in terms of seniority or perhaps they're a cultural leader that people look up to if they kind of give permission it gives permission to everyone else yeah and it's i'm thinking of two things one is this maybe it was used in a ted talk this video of the guy how to start a movement yeah this guy on a yeah yeah, yeah. on grass dancing like a fool is just a fool the second one is courageous but the third one makes it actually a movement Mm. so the first one without any support of anyone else is just a crazy person yeah right you running through the room of the leadership (laughs) team asking them to shout you're a change agent (laughs) you're a crazy person until the first and the second actually join you yeah as much as Jacques is a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> inviting us to dance and jump and sing Whitney Houston, yep. unless we join him. Absolutely. And this makes me think of an experience I had similar to yours with Emily um, at a university. And we started a strategy process. And I suggested my boss who was the a uni president, an exercise similar to yours. We're in groups of three. And I learned that from Patrick Cowden, who has been on the show. Everyone shares, who am I and why am I here? Yep. And then similar, connecting it to the purpose of the university. And the first time we did that with a group of professors, my boss was like, yeah, now Miriam will introduce an exercise and full stop. 
So he, this was his introduction of me and me for mm -hmm. bravery. Then he saw what happened. The next time with a new group of participants, professors, he was like, and now Miriam is like, introducing this exercise. And you might think that is kind of weird, <laughs> but stay with us. It's amazing. You're going to see. <laughs> and he wanted to participate again. Great. And it was such a difference in the atmosphere and also in my own confidence on how to introduce the exercise mm. to have the most senior person to actually have your back. Yeah. That, yeah, I think warming up a person to endorse you is Completely. super important. Yeah. And I mean, it's the same sense when you're like looking at like big change processes in organizations, you need that like senior permission. People look to their leaders so much. It's extraordinary. And if you've got those senior people, be they, you know, people at the top of the hierarchy or be they culture makers, actually having their endorsement and their support of something mm -hmm. Is, is so important because everyone wants to know what are they thinking? Like, what decisions are they making? How are they leaning into this? What benefits do they see? Yeah. Yeah, and maybe it's more of our role also as, a, as facilitators to give them a pep talk once in a while yeah. more than we actually think. Absolutely. You know, so, so much of my work as a communications professional, you know, you, it is a lot of working with leaders and going, okay, you are – the most crucial part of this whole process, you know, I can write the best speeches or I can do the best comms plans or like I can kind of do all of the work around to support this work, but actually I'm not the one delivering it because who cares what I think? <laughs> you know, I've, I'm not actually making the decisions here. I'm just helping make it happen. Yeah. So, actually it's the leadership that they're just, you know, the most important in that space and, and kind of getting them to understand how important their role is and how significant their role is. Mm. Yeah, that has, I think, the biggest impact on any change project. Yeah. And when you think of this role, what is your number one facilitation challenge? I think when you're facilitating change, the most important thing is like managing people's emotions and mm. allowing like allowing them to have them, <laughs> um, you know, that's, we were talking before about stress and change is stress. Like when you're a change manager, you're kind of well, you're almost inflicting stress on people. Like you, you <laughs> really, like it's, it's ne not necessarily your decision. You're, stress manager. Yeah, you're a stress manager. And so, it's like, okay, well, we've got this, this cohort of people that we need to work with to deliver change and people come with emotions and if something's changing in your work, that's going to impact your stress and your mental health and your physical health. And we have a responsibility to try and stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. And so, we have to be really cognizant of all the emotions in the room and also the emotions out of the room because, like, people have stress in their lives as well. So, maybe this work thing is going to be an inconvenience, but actually, like, they might have something really difficult at home and that's actually weighing on their mind more. And that may impact how they react to the work example. Yeah. So, being, you know, really, really trying to support or create space for the human experience is what makes change and change projects successful, really. Yeah. And I think that's why it all boils down when we are in conversation with groups to the check-in, just to acknowledge, to give them the yeah. opportunity to emotionally download and to arrive in the space yeah. and to how are you really <laughs> yes how are you really or yeah welcoming them and say yes bring your emotions and have a sandwich yeah <laughs> <laughs> completely yeah and what makes it fail what makes it fail uh so many factors i think you know the wrong timelines the wrong information not enough planning does pay a big impact as well yeah there's so many factors that makes change fail but You've got to create time for people. And if people are working together, like most things can happen. Mm. <laughs> if everyone's aligned on the same vision and the right culture's there and people are supported, like they can achieve amazing stuff. If the opposite is true, things won't work. We fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe also just being brutally honest. That, yeah, then people will leave and people can leave. And I, <laughs> I loved what you said earlier. Yeah, there's al we're always in control of one thing. We can stay or we can leave. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I think you do sort of see, like, we hear about like, quiet quitting. You know, people mm. just 
not engaging with their work and maybe not logging in or pushing the mouse around a few times a day, but not actually kind of contributing. And like that is absolutely people trying to take control. Like if there's something they don't like about work, they'll just go, well, screw you guys. I'm not going to engage. And and that's them taking control back. I haven't looked at it like that. Yeah. yeah silent quitting being a very active act. Yeah. Yeah. Behavior. And I think that um, a reply to silent quitting is definitely facilitation because it's about stakeholder engagement or engagement of team members in meetings. If you're given the opportunity to to speak and to voice your opinion, if you're included, there's no space to hide and to silently quit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways I was I was thinking about like the role of, you know, a psychologist and they're there to sort of ask the questions around why are you feeling this way? Why are you behaving this way? And then work out what the root cause is and try mm -hmm. and create strategies to overcome that. And it's like similar in this sort of environment in an organization, you are trying to facilitate an understanding of what is the root challenge. And so, if we have to do this change, really, why are people finding this difficult? What is the mm -hmm. actual problem and what is the actual hurdle or series of hurdles, which is the biggest one? Like, what's stopping people from just walking over and doing this? And then how do we actually come up with strategies and, and facilitate moving to that new state together? Mm. In your uh, experience, what are the key hurdles that make it difficult for people to buy into the change not understanding why <laughs> mm -hmm. is the biggest one i think if that's if that's not there like people are not gonna do it <laughs> people need to understand and, and you you hear this all the time when you do a survey or ask people like what do you want to see and change like how can we change better everyone's like we want to know why we want to know what's driving this mm -hmm. like all those sorts of factors that have gone into the decision they don't necessarily need to be part of the decision but they just want to know why it's happened and why it's come about so that's really crucial you know then you then of course you get to how <laughs> so if people can kind of understand why something needs to be done in a different way you then want to work with them to like work out how they do that and, mm -hmm. and help them understand that and help them practice it or kind of trial different things you know maybe that how is something you create together and and go okay well the why isn't movable we have to do this But actually how we do it is is something we can do together. And that's where we can kind of give that or have that control together of working out, you know, how do we collaboratively deliver this? Yeah. And then, yeah, the when and the who, I guess, all the details and logistics. And I wonder to what extent actually the why is sometimes the the first block weight where it breaks because maybe the leadership also doesn't really understand why. Yeah. And to what extent do you think also with your communications head on, is it a communication problem or is it a purpose problem? So maybe some changes are implemented, although there's actually not really a reason or there's a political reason that nobody dares to speak out mm. because it's the big elephant in the room or maybe they just lack the communication skills. Yeah. Those ones are tough. <laughs> And I'd say it becomes a comms problem. I think often if you do not have the clear motivation or perhaps the motivation is something you don't want to talk about, then it's kind of like, okay, well, how do we actually shape this into something people will understand and will care about? And, you know, in some cases, it's just like a leader who has made the decision because leaders have to be able to make decisions and gone, we need to move in this way now. And, you know, ideally you have the opportunity to understand a bit of the thinking But sometimes that doesn't work. Yeah. And so, that becomes tricky. I think uh, the, uh, people understanding why we're doing something is is really number one. Yeah. And if they don't understand why, you know, you end up with completely reasonable questions. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm thinking of the, of the case where, especially in the public sector in which you work a lot, many changes are looking in the future. Mm. So... For instance, the um, the level crossing, level crossing, yeah, where it's about yes, in ten years, once all the construction works are done, it will be fantastic. Yeah, but those who benefit from it are not the ones who have to suffer from the change. Yeah, and then to 
to explain the why and expect the people to buy and to be excited about, it's actually quite a big ask. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is such an interesting project because I think, you know, what it's going to be taking a train line that's currently crossing a road and putting it up in the sky so that it doesn't cross the road anymore. And that danger of like cars being hit by trains is gone. And that's obviously a really good outcome. (laughs) I don't think there'd be anyone in the community who would be like, no, we want these cars and trains to be sharing a crossing. Like it's, it's, you know, no one's going to think that. But that kind of process of like, how does that actually happen is going to be really painful. Mm. And like, People know that because they've seen it already. It's happened throughout the state. There's been lots of level crossing removals. And, I mean, how good is it when it's done? Like, there's you take a train in in a lot of of the train lines around here and those crossings have been removed. There's new park spaces, new green spaces. There's, like, better views. There's, like, safer transport. It's it's so many good things. But, like, you know, the, the pain to get there was difficult. And so, I think trying to work out like how do we support those people who are going to be impacted is a really interesting question for the council and the government which yeah. you know they're they're working through right now like we heard so much amazing community input at that forum yeah and i wonder to what extent it is actually translatable to organizations because there are these individuals who are really passionate about shaping even the the space for the future generations yeah. although they might go through difficulties but the opportunity to contribute and to have a voice in something to construct to build something Mm. might be even bigger than the pain of change yeah and i wonder whether this is this is something that how can you build how can you include those who are affected by the change that they gain control and shape the change so Mm. that they well, enjoy it. listening, <laughs> like you've got to listen to the concerns. Like, the, you know, obviously there were lots of concerns about, well, actually the thing that I found really interesting about that forum we did was that a lot of the questions and concerns were not just about the actual crossing removal itself. It was a lot about, well, we've got all these other issues that exist around this area how can we use this project to fix those as well? Mm. And so it's like, okay, well, there's actually a lot of bicycle safety problems one street away and there's an opportunity in this project to address that potentially at the same time. And so you've got so much passion and concern and like there's a beautiful thing to harness and kind of go, wow, we've got all these amazing passionate community members who want to make their community better How do we harness that? What a beautiful observation. And I wonder whether this is also something that we, that is easily overlooked in organizations. So to what extent is a change process just bringing forth or giving voice to everything else that is not working? Yeah. And that has been shoved under the carpet. (laughs) And then because suddenly there's, how did you call it? There's a, a ventil? No, there's a opportunity to release the pressure. To release the pressure. Yeah. Then all the pressure goes out through through that space. Yeah. Although the origin might be from somewhere totally different. And ideally, like those sorts of things shouldn't just come out in those moments. Like when you're doing a change, particularly in an organization, like so often you'll kind of go, Okay, we're gonna change this. And everyone will go, Yeah, okay, but like what about all these problems I've exactly. got? <laughs> and I mean, ideally, that is kind of part of a constant communication, like a constant dialogue. Like yeah. it shouldn't just be like, oh, we're going to listen to you now because we're doing this change. It, there should be a kind of constant conversation around how do we continually make our workplace better? Yeah. And how do we continually make our products better? And how we how do we always improve? And and I think workplaces that have that conversation mm. are ones where people feel like they're listened to and they feel like they can constructively shape the future. Whereas others where it's like, this change is happening, any thoughts, and, and yeah. it's like that's the moment to to talk about it and everything else. Yeah, and then if then the answer is no, I don't have concerns about this change. It's only why are we changing this and none none of the other things. Yeah. And then I think the biggest mistake to then make is to say, yes, but 
we're now focusing on that. So your concerns don't have space. Yeah. So how would you create space? Because just creating a parking lot where people can put their sticking no, sticky notes. <laughs> okay, I have so many concerns. Okay, let's park them. Yeah. And then what? I don't think that this would really be beneficial. So mm. would it make sense to deal with these concerns beforehand or to also address them or yeah i think it's it comes down to how the organization operates and i've been involved in a few organizations recently where they are moving towards this new state where they're always in like constant dialogue around what are the issues mm -hmm. how do we address it like and actually taking action and so i think where previously you know you'd have like a list of demands from a unionized workforce come in and say, this is what we want. And then there'd be negotiation or complaints and maybe strikes and whatever. Like, you know, we're in, an, in a country where uh, unions have been kind of had a lot of their power taken away, which is something else to talk about. But we're now in a space where like, we need to have constant dialogue with people and it actually creates better outcomes if, mm. if leaders are, really present and really understanding what their staff are finding really good and finding really negative. You know, a lot of organizations do like annual culture surveys and and like pulse check-ins and yeah. these sorts of things. And those tools, I mean, I know a lot of employees at the moment think like, oh, a waste of time. But actually, they, they're really valuable in helping to diagnose where the problems are. Yeah. Because if you look at an organization and go, okay, in this team, they've got problems with these five things, but these five things are really good. And then over in this team, it's the opposite. Like suddenly you can go, okay, well, that means we need to give this leader coaching on these things, these issues. And then maybe in this area, we need to change these things so that we can kind of, you know, improve that over there. And yeah, that idea of like creating a sense of cultural constant improvement in mm -hmm. workforces, constant dialogue is, is I think really important to changing culture and changing how we work but also you know then being able to have a workforce that's more flexible and adaptable when you do need to change for other things yeah what i find interesting is the wording so constant improvement can also mean yeah constant change so it's not one change project but it's yeah. just a continuous state of micro changes micro adjustments yeah and just reminds me of actually any relationship where you always have to be in conversation of what's working, well, what's ideally. not working, <laughs> because otherwise you have a big fight where yeah. everything comes exactly. out unfiltered. And there's the shopping list that has been like added to for months. <laughs> yes. And suddenly it's like, oh, we're doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll pull the book out. <laughs> you know, you don't want to get to that point. I think having those constant interventions it makes for a happy relationship and hopefully makes for a happy workforce as well. <laughs> it's a, that's one of those mic dropping moments. <laughs> makes for a happy relationship and a happy workforce. We're covering so much ground. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you going to title this? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where to go from there? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think it's that crucial thing of like, if you're working with people, <laughs> you have to understand them and see them as people and everything that they bring to their work. They don't just bring skills and knowledge. <laughs> There's so much more. And we, and you know, we want people to be authentic in their jobs and we want people to have mm -hmm. positive experiences and relationships and connections at work. Like to allow that, you've got to allow the human elements. Yeah. And it reminds me of the conversation I had with uh, Jeremy Dean of the Emotional Culture Deck, how to facilitate actually this conversation and to bring emotions mm. into the workspace without the connotation of this being group therapy, corporate yeah. therapy, but a healthy process. Yeah. Because well, I, I, yeah. we were talking the other day about that sort of therapy thing and I had this idea of like creating a change therapy session mm. where it's like, let's actually in a facilitated way, work through change together and acknowledge that it's hard and mm -hmm. acknowledge that there's good bits and bad bits, a lot of the challenging bits, but like actually approach it as a therapy session and kind of go, you know, we're here to kind of do this together. Let's, let's work it out. Yeah. 
I can already see some really kind of freaking out and running away. Yeah. Like, oh no, let's not sit in a circle and speak about our feelings. And funny enough, once once everyone leans in and dares, mm. everyone leaves with a smile, happens. right? Yeah. yeah. All we need to do is to nudge them into the very first yeah. To get them into the space and then lock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> create the space, create the permission, and then see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Corporate therapy. Mm. Change therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know how it works. Yeah, well, I'll see how it goes. I haven't got off the ground yet. I'm still probably convincing a few people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we need to change the name. If anyone's got a good idea, write in. <laughs> <laughs> well, almost one and a half hours. Mm. Anything that you wanted to say that we haven't touched upon yet? I think we've covered plenty of ground. <laughs> yeah. No. Beautiful, juicy conversation. Thank you, Reese. Thanks so much. I haven't asked you whether you call yourself a facilitator. I was waiting for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think increasingly I am moving towards that term. And I think last time you asked me that, I was kind of like oh yeah probably maybe i've you know discovered a lot about facilitation through never done before and probably a lot of the work i did or have done has been like intangibly facilitation mm -hmm. it's sort of like it is facilitation but it's probably not what people's understanding of facilitation is but By probably that you mean the communication part yeah mm. and certainly thinking about how you facilitate change or how you facilitate great communication in an organization that sort of stuff I have always approached with a facilitator's mindset, I mm. would say. And now I'm doing like a lot more actual classic facilitation. <laughs> like being in a workshop. Being in a workshop, bringing people together, try, you know, having flip charts and like ideas on the wall and, you know, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I'd say I am increasingly calling myself a facilitator. That might actually be an entire conversation as such. What is actually the core facilitation work? Is it really the work that happens in the workshop? Or isn't it even more the work that happens through the communication? So the bits between the bits, the liminal space mm. where groups actually or individuals don't come together, but that really creates the glue and the, how do you call the, the thing that makes the change process slide smoothly slide <laughs> hopefully a plan <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a roadmap or a yeah. you know strategy i don't know but I, like you know similarly with like when you're planning a workshop you've got like the basic elements of yeah. when you bring in people we've got some intro activities we've got some other workshop kind of collaborative activities and hopefully there's a bit of a destination where we want to get people to or an outcome we want to create it's totally the same in change. Yeah. You kind of go, this is the outcome we want. We've got to plan some activities to get there and make sure we've got the right people to deliver those activities. And, and you know, you open the doors and it all starts. Yeah. And if we don't need a workshop for that, it's even better. Mm. Mm. Facilitation without a workshop. Mm. This could be a nice title for the show. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Reese. Thanks so much. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening to the show. I know how busy you are and I appreciate that you're sharing your two most valuable resources with me and my guest, your time and your attention. If you're looking for more conversation with other facilitators and for a community of practice, why don't you join Never Done Before, the community that I have built and many of my podcast guests are already members. Visit neverdonebefore.org and I wish to see you there.